Every evening before we meditate, we have to chat on goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. And it's all too easy for that chant to become simply mouthing the words without we're thinking about what we're saying, even though it's translated in English. So it's good to stop and think. One, why do we have to chant? And two, are we getting the most out of it? The chant is there to remind us of our motivation. We're looking for happiness, but we're looking for happiness in a way that doesn't harm anybody, which means that we have to think about the happiness of others. So primarily we're doing it for ourselves. Because if we, if we can have ill will for anybody, that means we're probably going to behave in an unskillful way toward that person. And that becomes our karma. It's a drain on our resources. The Buddha talks about goodwill as wealth. This is the practitioner's wealth, he says. And it's an interesting kind of wealth. It's not the kind where you have to go out and do something to get it from somebody else. It's something you can produce from within. This is if you had your own printing press and you could print as much money as you wanted. And the more you print, the wealthier you are. So why is our account so small? Why do we not see goodwill as wealth? There's that strong tendency to keep score. Someone else said this to me, someone else said that to me. Things you don't like. That's keeping garbage. It's like those pack rats that just pick up whatever and stash it away, stash it away. But it's not wealth at all. It's just garbage. And why clutter up your mind with garbage? You can produce abundant goodwill, abundant wealth. Think of all the images the Buddha has for wealth, of the wealth of goodwill. The whole earth. You want your goodwill to be like the whole earth. And someone comes along and wants to make the earth be without earth, but they dig here and they spit there and they urinate here, thinking be without earth, be without earth. But the earth is so much bigger. You have to look at other people's misbehavior as like that pitiful little man trying to make the earth be without earth. You want your goodwill to be that large, that abundant. Make your goodwill like the river Ganges. Someone can come with a torch and try to burn the river away and they wouldn't succeed. The water just puts out the torch. Goodwill can be like space. People can try to draw pictures on space, but there's nothing there for the pictures to hang on to. You want your attitude to be that. Something that nobody can draw pictures on, no matter what they do. You don't keep it in mind. Particularly if you're simply keeping tally as to who owes what to you. So make your goodwill large. You can be as wealthy as you want. The Buddha talks about how if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't have enough for our, our essential desires. But goodwill, we can create huge amounts of wealth. And it can always be more than enough. Make that your attitude. If someone misbehaves to you, you want to overwhelm them with goodwill. Because look at this world. People are so poor in goodwill. The least little bit of disagreement and people draw lines and they get all upset. For what? 
We keep battling, 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 and then we die. We don't have anything to show for it. But goodwill raises the level of your mind. It's not innate. I mean, you have goodwill for some people. The human attitude is that you have goodwill for some, but not goodwill for everybody. You're trying to raise the level of your mind to a Brahma level. It's the Brahmas who have goodwill for everybody and have goodwill left over. So if you can learn how to think in those terms, you become a Brahma inside. So ask yourself, what's keeping you from generating as much wealth as you want? What attitudes are getting in the way? And remind yourself that it is heedful of you to be generous with your goodwill. As the Buddha said, all skillful qualities start with heedfulness or rooted in heedfulness. And goodwill is one of those qualities. Sometimes we're told that we just get in touch with our innately goodwill nature. But you look at little kids behaving, and it's not like somebody told them that they had to be partial in their goodwill. When you first try teaching goodwill to children, there are some people they say, no, I can't do that. How can I have goodwill for that person because that person did this or did that? You have to remind them, okay, the goodwill is not so much for them, it's for you. So it's an attitude that has to be cultivated, it has to be developed. You have to think your way to goodwill. They talk about a jitta of goodwill, metta jitena. You know, all the word jitta means both heart and mind. And the emphasis in goodwill, of course, is with the heart. It requires some of your head as well. When you think of somebody that you have trouble having goodwill for, you've got to ask yourself, why are you so stingy in your goodwill? What's the obstacle? Because what does goodwill mean? It means made that person be happy. How is the person going to be happy through his or her actions? So basically wishing, if this person is behaving in an unskillful way, May he or she see the error of his or her ways and be willing to, willing to change, willing to become more skillful. That's an attitude you can have for everybody. And you can ask yourself, is there anything I can do to help that person be more skillful? Rather than telling up all the bad things they did in the past, you're looking at them as a person with the potential, the potential to change. And so make it your your challenge. Is there anything you can do to help that person become more skillful? Want to become more skillful? You probably know the, the folk tale of the, the sun and the wind. They got into a discussion one day and they got into an argument as who was stronger, who had more power. And so the wind said, okay, I know. You see that man down there on, the, on, on earth, walking down that road with a bl blanket around him? I can blow that blanket away. You can't do that. And so the wind blew and blew and blew, and of course the man just clutched the blanket tighter and tighter and tighter. Couldn't blow it away. And then the sun said, okay, let me try. And the sun just beamed. And the man took the cloak off. On his own, took the blanket off of his own accord. The lesson, of course, being that if you try to force your ideas of what's right and wrong on other people, they're just going to hold even more strongly to what they've been doing all along. But if you figure out some way to make them want to change, then they'll be happy to do it. So goodwill requires more than just an attitude of the heart. It requires some thinking. This is why the Buddha gives those images. The earth, the river Ganges, space, talks about it as wealth. And 
And then once you generate it, then you try to protect it, as with all wealth. Because there will be people who misbehave, and you can't let that have an effect on your goodwill. Think of the example of the mother protecting her child. They said, just as a mother would protect her only child, you should try to protect your goodwill. Sometimes that passage is mistranslated as, you should cherish all beings as a mother would cherish a child. But the word cherish doesn't come in there at all. The word is protect. And it's not that you're protecting beings, you're protecting your goodwill. So that no matter what happens, even if you have to die, you're not going to give up your goodwill. Another image that the Buddha gives is of the bandits who are trying to cut you up into pieces with a two-handled saw. He says, if you let any ill will arise in your mind and toward those bandits, you're not following the Dharma. You're not following his teachings. You have to have goodwill for them, even as you're dying. Because after all, when you're dying, if you die with ill will, you're going to die with the attitude of wanting to get back at those people. And that's going to pull you down. Again, it's a case where your lack of goodwill is bad for you. It's not a question of people deserving or not deserving it. We, we talk about deserving when we have limited resources. We try to parcel them out. This person deserves that much, that person deserves this much. But here your goodwill is supposed to be unlimited. You give unlimited goodwill, infinite goodwill. And then you give more infinite goodwill. It's one of those weird math problems where there are levels of infinity. You can give infinite goodwill, and then you can give more infinite goodwill the next day, and then in the next. There doesn't have to be any, any limit. And when you have that much, you don't have to worry about who deserves and who doesn't deserve. You just give it to everybody. So learn how to be generous with your goodwill. The more generous you are, the more you get, the more you have. And don't approach goodwill with a shopkeeper's mind who has to tally things up and do the math. You should be engaging in the math of infinities. You don't need to keep keep tally of that. Just keep producing. And as the Buddha said, when you give abundantly, you're going to receive abundantly as well. You may not receive goodwill from other beings, but there's an inner sense of well-being that you create within your own mind, and you want that to be abundant. And it's something you can do. If there's anything in the mind that resists the idea, you've got to question it. Grill it. Don't let it have any force, because it's just going to make you poor. And you have to ask, why do you choose to be poor when you can be wealthy? So keep that image in mind. Goodwill is your wealth. And as I said, it's like having your own money press where you can print as much money as you like. And the value doesn't get reduced by having more of it. So the math of goodwill is not like the math of Poverty. It's the math of infinite wealth.